Our next speaker is Dr. Maulana Karinga, because after you've defined an Afrocentric education, the basis, the mound on which you're going to operate from are ethical principles. This is our foundation. So we have to understand what ethics mean to us as a people. Dr. Karinga. How about you, Yanni? Uh, on behalf of my organization, us, and my wife, Timoya, and companion, and all things good and pure, pure who have come to me, we'd like to say uh, we welcome you. Among us, you will always find your family in a peaceful place, and we wish for you blessings without number and all good things without end. And we bear witness as an African people that as our beginning was great and good, so shall our development to our eternity be if we dare struggle speak truth, do justice, and walk in the way of right. Hotel. Hotel. Ashe. Ashe. Headed. Headed. These, these, these three uh, words are calling good into the world. Hotep is ancient Egyptian, Ashe is Yoruba, and Hedi is Swahili. But they all invoke good into the world because as we will uh, reaffirm in our presentation today, and as we know as African people, the fundamental meaning and mission of human life, the Odu Ifa teaches us, is to constantly bring good into the world and not let any good be lost. All right. The name of my presentation is Mapping the Moral Terrain in African Education, the Ethical Teachings of the Husia and the Odu Ifa. These two sacred texts the Husia of ancient Egypt, and Odu Ifa of the Yoruba tradition, represent a core body of knowledge from which we can draw ethical uh, frameworks and ethical teachings to enrich and expand our lives and to serve as a fundamental body of information to communicate uh, to our students. What I want to do is present the ethical teachings of the Husia and the Odu Ifa in the language of modern moral discourse, while at the same time preserving and building on their distinctiveness as an ancient body of moral literature capable of framing and inspiring modern ethical reflection. One of the things that always happens is that people think if it's from the past, then it's of no longer any use. Christians should never say that. Jews should never say that. Muslims should never say that. Hindus should never say that. Buddhists should never say that. No one who reads from an ancient text should say that. Right. This only becomes a problem when you talk about African texts. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but you must always bring the past in the future and ask it, how does it apply? And how do we frame it? so that it can enrich and expand our lives. And I want to also provide both an interpretation and transmission of the classical African traditions of Mat and Ifa, which grow out of these texts, and for which these texts serve as a spiritual and ethical grounding. My presentation, of course, will be conducted within the Kawaita tradition, my tradition. Kawaita defines itself as an ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. Moreover, Kawita philosophy maintains that we must constantly dialogue with African culture in the ongoing quest to become and be the best of what it means to be African and human in the fullest sense. To dialogue with African culture is to constantly ask it questions and seek from it answers to the fundamental enduring con and enduring concerns of humankind. Concerns about transcendence, where do we go? Concerns about everyday life, concerns about human meaning, concerns about our rightful relationship with the environment, our rightful relationship with each other, our rightful relationship with the divine. These fundamental questions, how to create a just and good society, how to build a strong family, how to cultivate 
excellent male-female relationships. All of these deal with enhancing human life and enhancing the human future. Creating the moral person, the just society, and the good world. The Kawita approach is based on two things, tradition as foundation and reason as a moral necessity for feeling for others. Within the framework of Kawita, the tradition of Ifa and Mat, or approach, not simply as a context in which we come and absorb, but also as an ongoing process in to which and in which we contribute and thereby by enrich and expand the tradition. Now, I would really want to just stop a minute and say this. When I talk about Mat in the Matian tradition, I talk about Ifa and the Ifa tradition. I'm not talking about it as a past thing, a context in which I come. It is also an ongoing process to which I contribute and to which I hope I can add something. You see, the ancestors gave us certain things, but if we don't add to them, they are no longer a living tradition. They become a reference rather than a resource. And Kawita argues we must not use our culture simply as a reference. We must use it as a resource. That is why you must question it, seek from it answers to the fundamental questions of your daily life. What does it mean to be good? What does it mean to have an excellent education? What is our relationship with our elders, with our mothers and our fathers? That's called, in the seven cardinal virtues, Prior, pro, propriety. You see? Kawita argues that more reason and the more reason that goes into raising and addressing modern moral issues aids in our efforts to keep the tradition as a living, vibrant, and constantly developing tradition, representing the best of what it means to be both African and human in the fullest sense. Kawita argues that African ethics is rooted in four basic principles and concerns. One, the dignity and rights of the human person. That's key, we start with that. We start with the student when we teach. The dignity and rights of the person. But the person is not abstract. So the second one is what? The well-being and flourishing of family and community. Your essentially begins and ends with the individual and creates monsters in the process because they are extracted from family and community and therefore become self-satisfied, self-focused persons who do not understand struggle and stress, who do not understand not getting what they want and really going wild and shooting up schools because someone doesn't recognize them. In order for us to actually respect the individual or the person, we must respect them in what? A context of family and community. So you can't say you like me, but you hate my people. You can't say you want to educate me, but you resent and need to throw a police cordon around my community. If you are for the rights and dignity of a human person, the second thing is what? the well-being and flourishing of the community in which that human person grows, understands him and herself and speaks their special culture truth to the world. The third principle is the integrity and value of the environment. Black people like to say, well, you know, we are natural people, but they might not deal with nature at all. <laughs> Except again in America, what? in a very personal way. When they say nature, the call of nature, they're not talking about the woods. <laughs> you are teaching you to personalize everything. It's like the modern African intellectual, many of them. They personalize things so that they have engaged constantly in a dialogue of self-indictment based on the paltry evidence of their own life. <laughs> People take their personal life and pretend 
It is a statement about black people in general. <laughs> well, I don't want to, I, I, I got to get back. <laughs> well, I don't really think I left it. Yeah. But l- let me say, th- the fourth thing is the reciprocal solidarity in common, the reciprocal solidarity and mutual cooperation for mutual benefit of humanity. I will give those again. Uh, the four fundamental pillars of African ethic, the dignity and rights of the human person, the well-being and flourishing of family and community, third, the integrity and value of the environment, and fourth, the reciprocal solidarity and mutually beneficial cooperation of humanity. Now, if we're going to talk about education and ethical education, we're still talking about knowledge. And at the heart of the African concept of knowledge is the assumption that it is to pursue and direct it toward the good. So that at the heart of any education that Africans historically have engaged in, it has been to teach us how to pursue and direct our lives toward the good. The Husi of the sacred texts of ancient Egypt, especially the Sebae or the instruction, constantly stress that wreck or knowledge and wisdom is to be pursued and used in the interest of the good in three realms of relationships and practice, the divine, the natural, and the social. I'll come back to that in a minute. Likewise, the Odu Ifa, the sacred texts of the Yoruba, lists Ogbo or wisdom as the first requirement for creating a good will world and the first criteria for defining a good world. In other words, you can't have a good world if you lack knowledge. And you can't achieve a good world if you don't have knowledge. It's something, isn't it, that the first criteria for a good world would be knowledge. Why do you think it's not righteousness? Because if you were ignorant, you don't (laughs) even know what's right or wrong. You'll be worshiping false gods. And you'll even put them on your wall and pretend they're actually yours. Even though they're white. But we can get into that later. Fran said she wanted us to die. An African concept of education of necessity includes a process which transmits in various ways four species of interrelated knowledge. And all of them are ethically grounded. All of them. First, knowledge of the world. That's why Aunt Shoshone said, don't say you're wise, set yourself, don't say you're learning, set yourself to become wise. Study and learn the structure and function of the heavens. Study and learn the structure and functioning of the earth. Second, knowledge of ourselves in the world. Not just knowledge of ourselves. The second kind of knowledge that we teach in education in African tradition is first, knowledge of the world. Second, knowledge of ourselves in the world. Third, knowledge directed toward enhancing our ability to direct our lives toward good and expansive ends. And four, which Europe has pushed to the front, knowledge directed toward skills, choice and skill to pursue a vocation. But now the African adds a vocation that not only benefits us, but aids in sustaining and developing community society in the world. So Du Bois said it. Du Bois said we need to know how to make a living, but we also need to know about life, how to live life. We can't just be confirmed with making a living. We must also be concerned about what? What kind of life we live? And how does our education enhance our capacity to contribute to our community society in the world? So again, it is very important for us to have knowledge of the world, knowledge of ourselves in the world, not abstracted from the world, because otherwise it becomes personal again. I got to find myself. Where are you going to find yourself? In the water? In the sky? You got to find yourself in the world by acting. 
See? You know yourself in relation. You know yourself in action. You do not know yourself in isolation. Except in a very diminished way. Let's look at the Martin tradition and why that's so important. Certainly it's the oldest ethical and spiritual tradition. Predating all the other ethical traditions you can think of. I don't need to name the names because I don't want you to get defensive. But it precedes all of the others. Before even other people existed, we were teaching this. Okay? The, fun fun the fundamental principle in the Husea, and the Husea is a sacred text. The fundamental principle in the Martian tradition and in the Husea is Mat itself. This is something that we developed as a stress in the organization us in the early 80s, late 70s, when we argued how shall we define ancient Egyptian spirituality? What word can we use to focus on? So that black people, when they think of Egypt, stop thinking of this mythical pharaoh that has no name. But think about the most important gift Egypt gives the world a moral and spiritual tradition that inform the traditions that come after it. And we can talk about that too. Now, what does this principle might mean? This spiritual and moral concept. It means rightness. If you're looking for one word, it's rightness. If you want to become more spiritual and ethical in it, then you can say righteousness. That's why righteousness is not really one of the seven cardinal virtues. I'll give you the seven cardinal in a minute. Righteousness are the virtues together. Because that's what mod is, all the virtues together. Truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and order. Okay? It's very important that, that we understand that this concept, mod, which either means rightness or righteousness, and the reason I use rightness more than righteousness is because rightness is, is appropriateness and correctness that produces good. Now, when we get to propriety, maybe I have to strip, I have to, I have to get to, some things are right but might not produce the good because they're not done with propriety. In other words, you can't, tell, you can't tell people, even if they're homely, you know you're homely. <laughs> That's not proper. First of all, you might be mistaken. You're the one who said they're homely. Some people think they're pretty. That's why they choose them over you. <laughs> Rightness. <laughs> Rightness in three realms. I have to go a little faster here. Rightness in three realms. Rightness in the realm of the divine. What is your relationship with the divine? Second, rightness with nature. Rightness in the realm of, the na of nature. Right relationship with nature. And third, rightness in the realm of the social. Right relationship with others. Now actually, your relationship with God depends on your relationship with others and nature. In fact, in the, in the Husea it says, if you want to do good for God, do it for each other, especially for the poor, for God stands satisfied when the poor are cared for. So that you really can't give God money. You can't really do too much for God. You know that, don't you? But you can do a lot for your woman and your man and your children, and your neighbor, and your brother, and your sister. Do I need to go down the list? They need the money. They need the ear. They need to be heard and felt. What we have in ancient Egyptian or Martian tradition is the need to stand worthy before these three realms. Worthy before God, worthy be or divine. It's better to use the divine because people have different concepts of what God is. And the ultimate, the transcendent. And some religions don't have the word God. So it's better to talk about the ultimate, the transcendent. Because all religions have a concept of the tradition, of the ultimate or the transcendent. 
that which is beyond the ordinary, that is extraordinary and deserves an extraordinary deference and respect. Okay? Everybody has that, okay? So what we have in ancient Egyptians is that we must, at the end of our lives and during our lives, stand worthy before the ultimate uh, God, Ra, created the world. He conceived it in his heart and mind, spoke it with his mouth, and brought it into being. Sia is that divine uh, intelligence and creative intelligence who is the authoritative utterance that comes as a result of, of, of the tell, that comes after the conceptual conceptualization uh, of the world. What are some fundamental concepts that we teach in the class? One, the sacredness and unity of being. The Husea says that Ra broadened out in the world. In, 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 the, in the state of pre-creation, Ra broadened out, investing the field or ocean of possibilities with himself, differentiating himself, making himself into millions, so that the world has that divine character to it because it represents Ra having broadened out into the world. So that where Europe might have one city that's sacred, the whole world is sacred, in fact. And there are some cities or places that are the holiest of holy. We got those. But the whole world has to be seen as sacred and having an integrity and inherent value on its own. That's the basis for any serious environmental ethics. That's why in the text, in the creation text, they always say he created humans and then they link them with Mice, animals, birds, fish, insects, trees, plants, rocks, to impose a certain humility on humanity. Humanity is still special, but it must remember it is in the midst of creation of stars, planets. That's you can be high there. Everybody likes to be you know, associated with the creation of a star. But what about mice, <laughs> flies, insects? You see? So that's that balance. Look above and look below, and then look within. The divine image of humans, one of the greatest gifts that African people had given the world, and which for so long was claimed by Judaism and Christianity, is the concept that we are in the image of God, that he made us in his own image. In the book of Keti, 2140 BCE, before the common era, it says we are in his image and came from his very person. This is reaffirmed in the narrative of Jedi, a Middle Kingdom text, in which Jedi tells the Pharaoh Khufu, the Pharaoh has a name. He tells the Pharaoh Khufu that Khufu can neither experiment on nor kill even a nameless prisoner, because even a nameless prisoner is still, what he quotes, a noble image of God. The word is Shepesis, which means noble, noble in Precious, august, worthy of ultimate attention. That's a very important thing to teach the children. To teach the children first that the world is sacred. To teach them that they are sacred in the world. And that therefore the basis for the three respects that Freya had, that Sankova has on the wall, comes from this idea of the divine character of all of it, the sacredness of it. Sacred meaning deserving ultimate respect. Respect for self, respect for others, respect for the environment, respect for yourself and others because they are in the image. But also the environment itself is part of that which we call being and there's a sacredness and unity of being because all of it originates from the divine. Next is the centrality of character. In both Odu and Ifa texts, and I have to go a little fast now, you'll read that character is key. What is character? A relatively stable disposition toward rightness and good. Not a mindless habit or a memorized set of rules, but a relatively stable disposition toward doing good because you thought it out and found that it is worthy. The text says, it is the heart and mind which increases character. It is a strong teacher shaping disposition. The Husea says, character is very important. 
It is the might which creates your power. It is your character which makes you noble. It is might which creates your power. That is, rightness and righteousness is power. But nobility, being worthy of respect, that is created by your character. That is why we say in Kawaita, there is no royalty except in righteousness. So if you want to be a king, be righteous. If you want to be a queen, be righteous. And you're already royal, even before you get your robes. Next is the seven cardinal virtues. In 1984, I put forth that, studying the text, that there are seven cardinal virtues of mind. Truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, order. This, 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 this does not appear in the text, in this order, seven characters. It comes from defining mat. What does mat mean? And the text continuously use mat most often to translate these words, truth. To say mat is to say truth. To say mat is to say justice. To say propriety is to say mat. To say mat is to say harmony. To say mat is to say balance. To say mat is reciprocity. To say mat is order. Truth, it says, catch it says, speak the truth. Let it cling to your speech. I'm sorry, I'm just joking. Say, speak the truth. Let it cling to your speech. Justice. Kununu says, Kununu says, justice is for eternity. It goes to the grave with those who do it. And when they are buried and the earth enveloped them, their name is not erased. Well, they are raised and remembered because of the justice they do. Therefore, speak truth, do justice, propriety. I wish I had more time. Propriety is key. You can't leave that out as a virtue. A lot of times black people don't want to do propriety. They don't want to show what is appropriate to elders or to their mother or to their father or to each other. You can't, in certain ways, you can't talk to people without wounding them. So there are, this propriety means boundary drawing and doing what is appropriate. A lot of times if people just do rules, they don't reason. For example, people say, speak truth. That's the first virtue, right? <laughs> but suppose somebody say, I'm going to kill your mama. Where is she? <laughs> <laughs> That's why propriety comes in. <laughs> Doing the morally appropriate thing. <laughs> propriety also comes when it says, if you see an elder enter, don't you be sitting down. You stand up. It says, if someone comes and they're hungry and you're eating, don't you just keep eating. Propriety. It's proper. There's certain things I would never say to my mother and father. I, hey, that's a propriety. and We've got to talk. And one of the things most missing in modern education is a failure to teach propriety. One time they used to call it manners and courtesy and all that. And so it really was pushed to the side, but it's ethically grounded. Harmony, Jed Conception said, you have to be in harmony, even with people who are against you. He said, my mouth kept me from attacking others. I refused to participate in evil. He said, and my patience turn, made me turn my friends, made me turn my foes into friends and my enemies into allies. Balance, balance is so key. I don't have time to talk about it, he said, but those who are balanced are never blamed. Reciprocity, being the sejimic person or the person who hears and responds and takes responsibility and acts for those who act for them. In fact, the Husea says uh, that acting for those who act for us is my in the sight of God. Order, returning Mott to his place, but also it means discipline. One of the paradigmatic persons in Mott is a Geru Ma, one who has discipline. Um, and it says, um, the text Pebor says, one who has discipline has the equivalence of every teaching. I'm going to say it again. One who has discipline has the equivalence of every teaching. The centrality of service. Serve God that he may protect and provide for you. Serve a wise person that may teach you wisdom. Serve your brothers and sisters, you may be respected for it. 
Serve one who serves you. Serve anybody so you can prosper for it. And serve your mother and father so you can go for it and prosper. The Ephah tradition, real quick, I'm out of time, but I got to say it, okay? Ephah is the sacred name of the sage of Rumula, who brought and taught the world the moral and spiritual wisdom of the Odu or Ephah. Odu Ephah means baskets of sacred wisdom of Ephah. The text says that Oludumare, God, when he was creating the world, gave humans and divine ones baskets of wisdom by which, and there were more wisdom by which they could make the world good. From that you have the Odu Ifa, the baskets of ethical wisdom of Ifa. What are some of the fundamental concepts? One, the chosenness of human being. The Ifa text says that humans were chosen by God, Olu Dumari, to bring good into the world. In fact, the word Aniyan in Yoruba means chosen one. You are chosen one. This is a beautiful concept. Other religions are trying to get their members to believe everybody is chosen without diluting their own role. Because everybody wanted to believe they had. One group said it's the chosen, then the other group took it from this, said it didn't do what it was supposed to do, so they didn't do chosen. Y'all remember that? <laughs> then a third religion came and said it was the chosen next. Well, we'll solve that by reading old dude that said all of y'all are chosen. <laughs> and you're not chosen, listen, you're not chosen because of your hair or your color or your, or your, or your um, uh, whatever you got. You're chosen for a task. You're chosen to bring good into the world. The world is an ocean of possibility in Dogon, Egyptian, Yoruba texts. The world begins as an ocean of possibilities. And you are chosen to realize those possibilities to bring good into the world. All good, doing good is the essence of human purpose. I said that the fundamental meaning and mission of human life is the concept of bring good into the world. Teach your children that. Can you imagine that? So matter whether they want to be farmer or pharmacist, doctor or lawyer, janitor or judge, their role is to bring good into the world. That's what Martin Luther King meant when he said everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Mm -hmm. Bringing good into the world is serving. And we must teach that. The centrality of character. In, like in uh, the Husia, in the Odu, character is central. Again, character is a relatively stable disposition do of doing right. In 31.3 of the Odu Ifa, it says character is all that is required. And in 70.71, it said sacrifice is in vain if your character is deficient. And again, it says in 39.1, that all the good things in life that you may have, if you do not have character, they belong to somebody else. Next, the essentiality of sacrifice. Teach your children sacrifice. A lot of times people don't want to give up anything. We live in a culture of convenience. That's why we have convenient stores and convenient churches. Because people don't want to do things that take time. But the essence of the text, the ethical project in Yoruba, in the Odu Ifa, is you must sacrifice. You must give of yourself. Sacrifice on five levels. First, your heart and mind. Second, your effort. Third, your time. Fourth, your material goods. And last, your life. Not in terms of just dying, but giving your life to something of value. Most people don't want to make commitments. That's why marriages suffer. That's why relationships suffer. People will not give their lives to something of value, to another person of value. Essential goodness of the world. The Yoruba teach that there's a constant need to renew and enrich the world, that the world is essentially good, but it's often damaged, as the ancient Egyptians teach, by what we do and fail to do that is right. Therefore, we must constantly make the world good again and again. What is the criteria for a good world? Quickly, full knowledge of all things, happiness everywhere, freedom from anxiety and fear of hostile others, the end of antagonism with other beings on earth, like animals, reptiles, well-being of all, and the end of forces which threaten it. And finally, freedom from poverty and misery. And finally, let me conclude by saying, what is the criteria for achieving the good world? The first criteria is wisdom adequate to govern the world. Second, sacrifice. Third, character. Fourth, the love of doing good. Can you imagine not just, not just doing good, 
the love of doing good. Sometimes people be doing things for you, you wish they hadn't done it because the way they approach you with it. So the text said you must love to do good, especially for those who need it and those who ask for it.